Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good afternoon. Welcome to CSIS. And thank you for attending our event on uh, AI and AVs, Implications for the US-China Competition. Uh, this is a good topic. It's one that we uh, have done, uh, paid a lot of attention to because it's uh, of a key interest for, I think, national security, economic competitiveness, and international relations. We're lucky today to have uh, some excellent speakers. Uh, first will be Senator Gary Peters, uh, chairman of the Senate Homeland Security and Governmental Affairs Committee. He'll be delivering pre-recorded remarks. He'll be followed by John Bozella, president and CEO of the Alliance for Automotive Innovation, Auto Innovators. John has extensive experience in the automobile industry, the automotive industry, and his full bio will be on the website. Uh, and then Admiral Dennis Blair, who most of you I assume know, uh, currently not professor of practice at the University of North Carolina, and previously, of course, the director of national intelligence and the commander in chief of US Pacific Command. Uh, they'll be on a panel moderated by my colleague, Bill Reich, Reich, a man who needs no introduction. And so with that, why don't we go to the uh, recorded remarks of Senator Peters? Hello, I'm U.S. Senator Gary Peters, and I'm pleased to join you all for this important discussion on how we can advance autonomous vehicle technologies while ensuring that the United States remains a global leader in mobility innovation for years to come. As President Biden said while visiting our auto manufacturers uh, in Michigan, the future of the auto industry is electric. But I would also make an addition to that statement and say that the future of the auto industry is electric, but it is also autonomous. The deployment of more autonomous vehicles on our roads will not only save our planet and combat climate change by making cars more energy efficient, it'll also make our streets safer for both drivers and pedestrians by reducing human error and impaired driving that all too often causes crashes. For example, recent data shows that during the first nine months of 2021, more than 31,000 people died in car crashes. That's a jump of 12% from 2020, and this is tragic and completely unacceptable. Connected and autonomous vehicle technologies hold great potential to save lives on the road, and it's all the more reason why we must work to ensure AVs become a reality. In order to do so, we must lead the way in the safe development and deployment of AVs here in the United States. Private industry has already made great strides in developing and testing this technology domestically, but we must ensure that our federal laws and regulations keep pace, especially as we look to the future of manufacturing AVs at scale here in America. I have long led efforts to pass AV legislation in a bipartisan manner, and I will not stop until we succeed. We cannot let outdated rules such as requiring a steering wheel to get in the way of life-saving technology and innovation. We must also address related challenges like the chip shortage that threatens our economic competitiveness. And that's why it's absolutely imperative that Congress passes a comprehensive competitiveness package to boost federal R&D funding in addition to funding the CHIPS Act so that we can leverage domestic manufacturing to provide a secure supply of semiconductor technologies that the auto industry needs to grow and to innovate. Our competitors, particularly in China, are not holding back. They, they recognize that autonomous technology and the auto industry will be the driving force in the 21st century, not only economic, but also from a national security perspective. We cannot fall behind on the global stage. So thank you for all of your efforts to drive innovation and support technological advancement in the AV field. And I know that I'm committed to ensuring our country remains at the forefront of developing the vehicles of the future. And I know you are too. 
Well, thank you very much for that, from Senator Peters. That gets us off to, I think, a, a good start in the conversation. And as uh, Jim introduced them, we've got a very knowledgeable uh, group of people here. We thought what we would do is have a discussion uh, rather than formal presentations. So I have the, uh, the easy job. I get to ask questions and the other three get to answer them. Uh, and then we'll do that for a while. And then we'll have time, uh, I hope plenty of time at the end for your questions. <clears throat> so if you have questions, um, put them in the Q&A or put them in the chat and uh, we'll find a way to get to them uh, once our discussion is, uh, is over. So <clears throat> I think what we're going to focus on is several of the points that, that Senator Peters uh, began with. And in particular, we're going to look at the US-China competitive aspects of this and, and the implications uh, of that competition, the significance of, of, of global leadership in, in the AV sector or, or the absence of global leadership in the AV sector. Um, and the security aspects of that, in addition, simply to, you know, it's nice to be ahead, but there are reasons why you want to be ahead. And one of them is uh, national security related. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, we're also going to later on talk about uh, specifically about some of the military applications of AV technology, uh, which, of course, is, is an important security element. But we're also going to get into something that also something that Senator Peters uh, mentioned as well, which is what the United States needs to do uh, to maintain its position of leadership. And uh, there in particular, we've got uh, uh, John Bozella from the Alliance for Automotive Innovation there to help us uh, figure out exactly what, uh, what we need to do to get this industry moving even faster than it already is. Uh, and as the Senator pointed out, there's already been uh, a lot of innovation already, but we have a long way to go before we are converted, if you will, to to AVs. So let's start in with the the big the, sort of the big picture uh, uh, issue of China competition and and security. Um, and I guess the, uh, the the biggest picture issue is the <clears throat> how do autonomous vehicles, both civilian and military, play into the larger geostrategic competition? between the United States and China. Is this peripheral? Is it central? Is it important? Who wants to comment? Yeah, I'll, I'll start, Bill, if, uh, if that's all right. The, yeah. um, the, uh, <clears throat> if you look back a little bit, uh, China tried hard for many years to break into the internal combustion engine uh, generation of, uh, of, of transportation. They, they, one of their traditional game plan, which is to bring in foreign partners, uh, learn from the foreign partners, kick them out, build their own companies, protect their market, and then go back as a, an exporting uh, behemoth beating beating these foreign competitors at their own game. And they, they never quite did it. They, uh, they were not able to uh, develop these, the real complicated set of skills that you need for uh, gasoline engines. And so they made a strategic decision here about five years ago that uh, uh, the world is going to electric vehicles. They're simpler to operate. They All of this entrenched technology and knowledge are not necessary. So we're going to, uh, we're going to jump to uh, EVs as our, as our focus. If you, if you read this uh, uh, document made in China 2025, uh, electrical vehicles and artificial intelligence are listed as two of the 10 areas in which uh, China <clears throat> wants to seize world uh, intellectual and industrial uh, leadership. And uh, it made a lot of sense for them to go to these EVs to try to dominate it as they were unable to do in the gas field uh, to solve their what's called their Malacca dilemma, which is that 70% uh, of their uh, oil comes out of the Persian Gulf across the Indian Ocean through the Straits of Malacca and the U.S. Navy, of course. Uh, I mean, they, they use that at the sufferance of the U.S. Navy, which could close it any time if there were if there were a conflict with uh, China. And they not only poured a lot of resources into the, the vehicles and the, and the uh, software in the vehicles themselves, but they've also uh, gone around the world and, uh, and invested uh, in a lot of the places where the components for uh, electrical vehicles uh, and autonomous vehicles uh, come from. So cobalt, nickel, manganese, rare earths, and they have, 
uh, sewn up some of these uh, leases in in Africa and other parts of the world. And what they have particularly uh, built are the production facilities in China for uh, turning these ores into the uh, semi-finished materials that then go on in, in the supply chain. So for example, we read about uh, mega gigafactories of batteries being built in Utah for, uh, for uh, Teslas. And it turns out that those are just assembly plants to put together anodes and cathodes and other materials that are actually processed in China. And so the United States, instead of becoming a, uh, a complete battery uh, producer, risks becoming a uh, an assembler, uh, sort of the uh, the position that China had um, uh, in, in many other areas. So this, uh, I think you have to understand the EV challenge in terms of this considered strategic hold of government decision that China has been making and pursuing for about uh, about 10 years, uh, 10 years or so. Uh, I think the other thing that's important in the competition with China is that is to understand how big the automotive sector is in the US industrial uh, sector. I mean, if if the United States loses full spectrum industrial capacity in the automotive industry, and this means designing the cars, testing them, building them, fixing them, the whole ecosystem, uh, then then uh, we are hollowing out uh, the the uh, industrial sector that we counted on to become the arsenal of democracy in the Second World War, to become the that it was the industry we turned to when we were short of equipment early in COVID, uh, for example. So it's uh, uh, just, although the United States economy has gone to primarily a uh, primarily a services based uh, economy, this industrial capacity is incredibly important, important to the military sector, as we'll talk about later. And at the heart of it lies the industry. So I, I think the, the big picture is China's all a government push and the importance of the uh, automotive sector to American industrial uh, capability. That, that would sort of be my uh, two big concerns on it. Jim or John, you want to add anything? Yeah, if I could. Um, first, I, I think Admiral Blair did an outstanding job of, of, of laying out, you know, sort of what the, the, the big challenge here is. Um, the countries that, that really take the lead in developing cutting edge innovative technologies in the auto sector are going to control the supply chains, set the standards, set the running rules and really own global markets. And that's the concern. And I think Admiral Blair has said it right with regard to EVs, you see US, uh, the US industry already behind China uh, because we're competing with a, a national effort that the Admiral described. When you look at AVs, I'd argue from an industry perspective that we're, we still maintain a lead, a technological lead here in the United States with regard to AVs, but we've reached an inflection point and we're moving now from research and development to the development of use cases and the deployment of businesses. And yet we don't have the running rules to really make that transition. China will very quickly catch up because they won't run into uh, the types of challenges that we are here with regard to the development, uh, you know, of a broad national policy. And so, you know, my concern is that that the EV story that Admiral Blair so well told is a cautionary tale for us with regard to AVs here in the United States. Jim, you want to add anything? Just a couple quick points. I think John's point on the flexibility of Chinese regulation is an important one it's a significant advantage. And that doesn't mean they don't have regulations. It means they just are quicker at making decisions about them. Um, one thing, and this might also be for John too, is that we've seen the Chinese develop, they've had this goal since Deng Xiaoping to develop a economy that would catch up to the West. And so now you see a commercial airliner, you see telecom equipment, you see computers, and you see cars. Are they on the same trajectory as, uh, Japan or Korea, you know, starting out being low budget and then moving into the market or, you know, they have a brand problem. Um, where do you think China is going to go on that? And I, I think that's one of the big issues for China policy is that Chinese may, may have aspirations, but they lack global trust. And there's only so far that uh, 
there's only so far that subsidies will compensate for that. But there's only so far that we can rely on that for not moving quickly enough. But that's kind of the thing I was wondering is, are they going to be the next Korea when it comes to cars or are they, or are they just going to repeat, as Admiral Blair said, their, their uh, previous uh, fail to take off? Yeah, I, you know, it's an interesting question. I, I, the way I look at it is I, I, I think in, in some ways, uh, I, I, think, I think the Chinese from an auto industry perspective have learned some important lessons from what, uh, how uh, the Japanese industry uh, has developed and exported uh, and how Korea has. And arguably, you know, with regard to the leapfrog over internal combustion engine improvements right to EV technology that the Admiral described, that would indicate uh, a level of, of learning. They didn't take the 25 year journey to improve uh, greenhouse gas emissions and criteria pollutant emissions from, from gasoline engines, they jumped over it. Uh, and so, and they had the ability to do that for reasons that I think you, uh, Jim and, uh, and Bill, and certainly the Admiral are probably more equipped to describe than I am. Um, but that, that leapfrogging ability could certainly be applied here to AV technology, and that ought to be a, a concern for us. Um, we do have an opportunity to continue to lead uh, because the benefits of highly automated vehicle technology are so important to us. The safety benefits that we heard the Senator refer to, the emissions benefits, the mobility benefits, and the equity benefits of, being, of people being able to move more effectively uh, uh, and, and more efficiently. Uh, uh, are really important benefits. And so we, we, we certainly don't want to be dependent um, on other economies uh, and other uh, uh, and other countries uh, for those technologies. We've also seen this problem with regard to microprocessors. Uh, we do need to control our own destiny when it comes to these technologies. I'll add one more point here, and we'll probably get into this a little further. You know, I think a lot of people think about the automated vehicle technologies, and they think about the cutting edge companies that are uh, in San Francisco and Pittsburgh um, that are doing great work um, uh, uh, to develop um, the, uh, the AI and the computing power uh, and the software associated with automated vehicles. But that work supports a broad industrial base all across the United States, a whole panoply of auto manufacturers and hardware suppliers that will build the actual vehicles. Uh, and so to the Admiral's point about the US industrial base and the US automotive industrial base, we want to maintain a strong, competitive, vibrant automotive industrial base and AV technology allows us to do that. I think one, one other big picture question that I'm really not clear in my mind on is sort of the, uh, the hardware versus software part of it. I mean, e AV is almost entirely software part of it. I mean, the LIDAR cameras, the radars and so on are pretty, are pretty standard. It's just who can be the cleverest in, in putting it together. And the, uh, yeah, the, the history of software development is that it's awfully hard to predict. And if you, and if you standardize and, uh, and, and freeze too early, you probably are going to, uh, to make the, the, the wrong decision. I think inherently the American system leaves more flexibility to allow the technologies to play out uh, because they have to attract capital and, they, and they, you've got to make money and you've got to compete with the others. The, the Chinese uh, have a, a tendency to freeze technology early and uh, try to drive uh, try to drive dominance through scale on a on a frozen uh, technology. And I don't quite know how this one is going to play out in the in the AV part of it. In the EV part of it, I think that, as, as John said, the, the, um, the, the think it's pretty well known what an EV is going to look like. There can be some marginal improvements and, and, and China uh, can, uh, can get ahead. When it comes to AV, uh, all of these questions of slowing, slowing rates of uh, improvement in recent, uh, recent uh, months in, in, in safety features and uh, and and uh, weather conditions and reaching the limits of that technology and all uh, all of these argue that we should uh, uh, keep the keep the technology open for a while and let ideas compete and generally the United States ecosystem is better at that than is the is the Chinese uh, system but I, I I haven't sorted out out in my mind. Uh, 
certainly at what the senator said we've, we've got to have a a, a, a a an arena so that we can try those different technologies and, and not drive them off the roads uh because of uh you know one unfortunate accident and so on uh, but but I'm, I'm not sure that the united states might not continue to keep an advantage of av because of our flexibility so i don't know your thoughts on that john yeah, I, I think it's a great question, Admiral, and, and I think that the, the 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 word arena that you used is such an important one because that's the concern I have. Um, as we move, as I said, you know, it's a, billions of dollars have been invested uh, in this technology, and, and so now we're ready for deployments. Uh, and so to take that next step to safely and effectively to test and deploy on public roads at scale to do the types of proving out and to allow that competition to take place, we're not really equipped to do yet. The, the Department of Transportation here in the United States has some, to, to my mind at least, and I think uh, many in the industry, some more work to do to create that environment and to create that arena. You know, frankly, I, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know I, I think there needs to be a sense of urgency about this. Um, we do, there are tools in the regulatory toolbox that allow the regulator to get this technology onto the road in a safe manner, determining that the vehicles they're replacing, in other words, vehicles with, that are, uh, with humans that are using their hands and feet are as safe or frankly safer than, than uh, you know, the, the, the vehicles we're replacing, the automated vehicles are safer uh, than human drive be, driven vehicles. Let's use that tool in the toolbox to allow for this deployment um, onto public roads now at scale, um, not, not a couple thousand here and there, but a hundred thousand or more so that we can prove out Admiral, um, um, you know, the technologies that we're talking about. And we're not talking about a beta test here. What we're talking about right. is a regulatory process where the regulator determines uh, on a, using data um, that these vehicles are safe. <laughs> Uh, and then we move forward, we collect the data, we, we, we learn more, and we, and we continue uh, to develop and, 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 and go forward. That, that's really what we're talking about here. We don't have that. And I'm concerned that, 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 that the China process is seamless. There is no sort of bump in the road. There's no point at which they've got to stop and make that determination. So we, we've, got to, we've got to do that. I want to come back to I want to come back to China, but I let me, uh, John. You just said something I wanted to follow up on. How do we, how do we scale up that, that big and that fast safely? Yeah, that's the question. So, so uh, you know, again, and I don't, I don't want to get too uh, in the weeds here, um, but there is an existing process uh, in the Motor Vehicle Safety Act in the United States, uh, and, uh, managed by the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration to allow companies to apply for an exemption, what's called an exemption to a typical motor vehicle safety standard that requires hands and feet and eyes and head position and body position. Uh, and, and a company that applies for that exemption has to prove that this vehicle with this technology is as safe or safer than the vehicle that's human controlled. That process is antiquated. It needs to be modernized and improved to allow for these technologies and these technologists and innovators to apply to allow, to, to allow for those deployments. That's um, one very concrete, specific way we can move more quickly and with a greater sense of urgency to realize the benefits uh, of automated vehicle technology. Like all of these things, isn't it? It's just so ironic. I mean, the, the, the thing that makes driving dangerous is drinking, <laughs> underage, not keeping your vehicle in repair. You know, we, we know all of this. And yet one, I mean, it sounds heartless, but one software glitch recording re resulting in one crunched front end of a cruise vehicle and a stop sign being turned over stops, stops things cold for uh, for uh, weeks, I, I mean, I think the nits of people have to uh, follow the data, you know, and not not be driven by one well publicized uh, well publicized uh, in incident, which is um, which is uh, often what seems to uh, seems to happen. Because we do have a bit of a culture clash here, don't we? That that uh, you know, what are the slogans that come out of Silicon 
Valley, uh, go fast and break things, uh, you know, fake it till you make it, uh, disrupt, you know, th th those are not automobile terms that, <laughs> that people like to hear when they, uh, when they're buying a car. And, uh, and I think, so I think the, you know, the Waymos of this world and the, and, and the, uh, the AVs that are growing out of Silicon Valley need to get a little bit uh, more of the safety conscious that the GMs and the Fords have, have had to live with for many years when they will, well, you know, I just had my, I just had my Bolt uh, completely battery packed replaced because of two, two fires and two garages uh, among 400,000 vehicles. So it's a, you know, we, we, we've just got to let the facts drive us in this thing and, and not be sort of uh, pushed around either by fear of China or by fear of one, one accident. Uh, we, we've got to get back to following that, the data. One of the things that came up in the prep for this that I thought was interesting uh, is the legislative, the legal limit of uh, 2,500 cars a year uh, if they don't have a steering wheel or pedals. Because I don't know about others, but I always, you know, you see the video of the driver's car and it's got a steering wheel. I think, well, how come? And it turns out it's a it's a it's a legal requirement. So we um, twenty five hundred is not a lot in the car market, and that's one that probably deserves a second look. I guess the question that I'd like to pursue on that is: it seems to me that that uh, I mean, I'm thinking about this that the if if we were entirely an AV country where all vehicles were autonomous. I think the the safety uh, claims, the environmental claims, all the the claims that have been made for this would be uh, would be validated. Um, on the other hand, if you have only twenty five hundred vehicles out there being tested, you know who cares? Uh, the problem is a transition. How do you get from A to B? What happens when you have a population where you know half the vehicles being driven are autonomous and half of them are people making mistakes? Um, and how do we deal with that situation? Because we have to get there. We can't, we can't go from zero to a hundred overnight. So there's, this is going to scaling up is going to take time. It seems to me. Yeah, yeah I'd agree with that. And, and I think part of the scaling up and, and, and this is builds on at Jim's question about the 2,500, those were the, that's the limit, uh, under the exemption authority I was discussing earlier. Uh, for any exemption to any federal motor vehicle safety standard, where, whether it's the one requiring a steering wheel or you know whatever it happens to be, um, and so uh, part of scaling up is, and, and this will connect to something Admiral Blair just said. You need data, right? The agency needs data to be able to make smart decisions about how to continue to develop this broader uh, policy environment, and so you know, increasing that number from 2,500 to something much higher um, allows for that transition to take place, allows for the agency to do the analysis to determine that those deployments are safe or safer and to collect data to continue to inform uh, 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 the, 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 the public through the agency as well as, as the industry about uh, key developments. And so that's really a key aspect of the transition. Another key aspect of the transition is continuing to educate consumers. A big piece of this is going to be customer acceptance uh, and customer awareness of the benefits of the technology. If we limit deployments to tiny little pilot programs here and there, customers, the general public will never really learn about the benefits and that will slow us down also. And so I think we do need uh, broader deployments for a public acceptance and a public uh, education uh, 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 aspect. And then the last point I'd make is, is remember, of course, we're going to have a mixed fleet of vehicles. We'll see highly automated vehicles in the near future that are, uh, you know, first and last mile package delivery, uh, 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 livery, uh, moving people uh, in cities, as we're already seeing. Uh, and then you, but you will also see um, vehicles with advanced safety features uh, that still require a driver to be present and engaged in the driving process. Keep in mind some of that hardware, uh, cameras, sensors, LIDAR, that is associated with driver assist systems are also the building blocks for highly automated vehicles. And so, um, you know, and, 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 and safer uh, conventional vehicles 
uh, will will help uh, us manage a mixed fleet. I think I think the other thing that we don't really fully grasp yet is how revolutionary autonomous vehicles will be. I mean, center. We, we all know about safety. M most accidents are caused by humans, and if you can minimize that, uh, you, you'll those thirty one thousand deaths will come down. Um, we we know that an, auton an autonomous vehicle would be a tremendous. Uh, advantage to uh old, older people to you know the, the ones who who uh don't want to drive anymore but need to get around there'll be a tremendous advantage and we did a study on this at safe the uh the <clears throat> securing american future nonprofit i'm part of on the way this will allow uh low-wage workers who now rely on inadequate public transportation to get to their jobs, you know, taking three buses across town, getting up at four in the morning in order to get to a job at six o'clock. If they can, uh, if they can order up an autonomous vehicle, it'll come pick them up and take them there. I mean, just what a, how much better that will be, how it will add to the incomes of uh, people who are just struggling to, to get by because they can get to the jobs more easily. But when you, when we get into the, and I'm sure we're going to talk about it later, the, uh, 5G enabled vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to person, person infrastructure uh, jobs. We, there are just going to be massive changes in, in the way that the, uh, in the way that I think that the uh, gasoline vehicle built suburbia be, because it allowed uh, people to live uh, a drive away from their job instead of a walk away or a bus or a trolley ride away from their job. And I, I think, you know, John, I, I just haven't seen that that sort of visionary. Uh, what this all means uh, for autonomous vehicles come to it, it still seems more like a, a safety issue, a convenience issue, rather than a transforming uh, issue. And I, we want to stay ahead while that happens, because I think that will really ignite it, uh, ignite the vision once it once it uh, is grasped. One of the interesting yeah, things to look at is uh, generational, right? And so when you talk yeah. to a lot of people in their 20s or below 30, uh, many of them don't own a car and don't want to own a car, uh, and they'll take advantage of these services. Now, maybe that will change when they get older and get, have kids and move out there. But, you know, I think we're seeing a shift in how people consume uh, transportation. Uh, this is part of it. You know, another part is that we're seeing the same technologies in other uh, autonomous technologies in other vehicles. And so if you if you follow the drone market, the big the big change for me, if if you if you ever had a drone, one of the early stage drones, what you immediately did was crash it, right? Mm -hmm. And now the drones that are coming on the market are AI guided to avoid that kind of crash. So there's gonna be interplay between the two technologies, there'll be changes in demand. Um, one of the questions for us is, uh, will the automotive sector be a leader in this or will there be things that keep them kind of behind some of the other autonomous uh, areas? Well, let me yeah let me come back to uh, <clears throat> pick up on that and go back to something that uh, Admiral Blair said because he, he talked about jobs and mentioned jobs and one of the issues that has come up here is that this uh, if you think about truck drivers this may put a lot of people out of work is this net is is our AV is going to be net job creating or are they going to be job losing and if the latter what do we do about that John. Yeah, well, first of all, let, let's start with what we know about jobs as a result of automated vehicles today. We're creating new jobs as we speak as a result of U.S. investments by technology leaders in highly automated vehicle technology. We're seeing uh, pilot programs across the country. We're seeing uh, um, communities of of, of, of companies, competitors, startups in places like Pittsburgh and uh, San Francisco and other places across the country where there are thousands of jobs being created. Um, yes, engineers and software developers, uh, but also, uh, you know, test drivers and, and, and engineers uh, designed to uh, fit these new technologies into the physical constraints of a vehicle. And so we're seeing right now job growth uh, in the sector. Um, we're also seeing the opportunity, as Admiral Blair mentioned, for these technologies as they deploy to allow and support access to mobility for people who need to get to work. 
Um, so, so I do think that as we see AV, uh, AV as a mover of people come into the marketplace, that's going to support employment for people who can't get to work. Um, beyond that, I also think, you know, you see there are places in the economy where we have a shortage of jobs right now. Um, for example, in moving goods uh, and highly automated vehicles could help solve those job shortages. With regard to how this develops in the future, we do need to continue to work on what that looks like. Uh, we need to continue to be invested heavily in K to 12 education to make sure that we have um, that we have students that are going to come into the economy um, with the skills required for uh, cutting edge technologies like the automotive in innovation uh, I industry, rather, as well as the economy more broadly. Uh, so those are really the, 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 the that's the way I look at it. Net net, where does it come out? I mean, that's a question that we'll begin, continue to invest, uh, look at over the next 15, 20, 25 years. But right now we're up to a, a great start with regard to job creation from the sector. The political problem that comes up, and I get this all the time when I work on trade issues because it comes up there as well, uh, is the people that are losing the old jobs are not the same people that are getting the new ones. Uh, and so you end up with, you're, you're creating a lot of new opportunities, uh, but they're for people with different skill sets. Uh, and you've got the people that have the old skill sets, uh, and many of whom are not in a position economically or not of a mindset to acquire the new skill sets. Uh, and that creates that, that creates a, pol a political problem, but uh, I'm not sure there's a solution to that. Uh, let me. We're getting but, some actually. Bill, could I ahead. just yeah. raise one point on that? I, I mean, John glanced at, but I, I think that the job creation will be in new companies that use autonomous vehicles for their for their purposes. Uh, uh, It'll just be a workaday piece of technology that says, "Oh, I can use this to do X, Y, Z," and those those companies will hire people with all sorts of skills. It'll be sales, marketing, delivery, uh, everything. It won't be necessarily, um, you know, troubleshooting a, uh, a com an open source computer program on a uh, on a new type of vehicle. It'll be a new company, new slice of industry that has been made possible because AVs exist. And so, I tend to be on the optimistic side that this will this will create a, a whole wide range of jobs, not all of which will require a Carnegie Mellon uh, computer science degree. Yeah, and that it's as Bill knows, every wave of automation has been greeted with these fears. Going back to the late 18th century and every time they've proved wrong. So it's bumpy and there's things we can do in education and in social support networks to smooth the path. but. You know, overall, Keynes wrote an article in 1930 about how automation was not going to kill employment. And I don't think it'll be any different this time. Well, this is why I said yeah. it, was a, it was a political problem more than a, a yeah. substantive problem. You're, you're right about the answers. But let me, uh, uh, we're getting some really good questions from the audience. And I want to cover a couple of things before we turn to them. Let me go back to Admiral Blair for a minute and ask you to say a few words about the military aspects of, of this. So far, most of the discussion, most of the public conversation has been about the commercial market, the civilian marketplace. What economic and innovation value uh, do military applications of, of AV, AV, AVs present, present? And are there military spillovers into uh, the civilian economy of AVs? I mean, I think it's worth remembering that the whole AV Thing started with a DARPA grand challenge, in, in which, uh, in which uh, a friend of mine put out a, I think it was a hundred thousand dollar prize to the team that could uh, could have an autonomous vehicle go. To, uh, oh, I think the original one was about twenty miles of desert, and nobody made it the first time, and so on. So, uh, you know, people in the armed forces uh, will take advantage of uh, machines that can. Uh, can go into dirty, difficult places that you have to take extraordinary measures to protect a, a pilot or an operator or, a, or a, uh, a driver. So there will be no, no lack of, um, of uses for autonomous uh, uh, land, land vehicles, just as uh, drones have been, uh, have exploded in, in their uses in the armed forces so that uh, infantry squads take them out of their back pockets and toss them up in the air to look over the next hill. Uh, 
Uh, and I think autonomous uh, vehicles will be uh, will be no different. You'll send them uh, where you uh, <clears throat> where you can to save your people for for doing other other things. So um, I I I just think that uh, we will take uh, we will take in the armed forces uh, full advantage of whatever kinds of kinds of uh, ground mobility. Uh, without a without a driver come out, come out of this and uh every, everything from logistics just getting getting the food and the food trucks to the right uh place uh, up through uh sending out a, 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 a <clears throat> scout car down a road that might have ieds on it uh and and before you you blow real so soldiers and marines up you you'd like to uh you'd like to neutralize it uh up through uh, putting uh, weapons on some of these uh, on some of these autonomous uh, vehicles, so you can send them out to actually conduct uh, armor armor attacks into t terrain that uh, you, you normally have to send out uh, armed tanks and and Bradley fighting vehicles and so on. So I I think the the armed forces will take tremendous uh, uh, use of them. And of course, I'm not sure the spillovers, but the uh, but the Navy and the Air Force are also thinking in terms of unmanned uh, unmanned vehicles because the uh, extra equipment we put into either an airplane or a or a ship so that people can be on it uh, uh, adds to weight, adds to complexity, adds to cost, and the the more uh, that we can have AV types of thinking into uh, air and maritime vehicles as well as ground ground vehicles, the more effective we can be. Has the Russian invasion of Ukraine changed our thinking about this or accelerated the, the urgency of moving on this? Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I've seen any specific um, Ukraine based uh, weapons that have suddenly shown their shown their shown their worth. But uh, just in, in general, making people realize that uh, there there are bad guys out there who uh, are going to attack. That uh, withdrawing from the Middle East doesn't mean the end of uh, war fighting as we know it uh, is going to. I think keep a fire under people to uh, in the armed forces and more acceptance within the public uh, to uh, keep our armed forces on the cutting edge and and being effective. Let me go back to China for a minute, and then we'll. We'll turn to the, the audience because we are getting a number of good questions. Uh, something that we were talking about back in the beginning and something that, that uh, the point that Admiral Blair meant reminded me that some of these questions, particularly about China, are not new questions. Uh, we've been wrestling with these for, for a very long time. I recall when I was in the later days of my uh, government service in the year 2000, I attended a conference sponsored by one of those agencies that Admiral Blair has been affiliated with in the past that we don't usually mention the name of. And uh, the, the topic was, what will the Chinese economy look like in 20 years? So this was 2000. And so now 22 years later, you know, we can see who was right. The debate at the time very quickly evolved into uh, a kind of a binary option. Were they going to be the world's most efficient producer of other people's stuff? Or were, were they going to be able to turn the corner and become an innovator and, and designer and creator of their own stuff uh, and, and produce that? At the time, which was 22 years ago, uh, the majority felt the former uh, and not the latter. Uh, and uh, I was in the minority, so I'm, I'm, I continue to ask that question. Is AV an example where they've turned a corner and are going to be uh, an innovation and design leader in this sector. Uh, and have we, uh, or is this up to us and whether we compete with them effectively or have, uh, have we already lost out? Well, I think um, as always, Xi Jinping is, uh, is doing us all a favor by attacking uh, the very best Chinese companies that are showing innovation and, uh, and, and, the, the Chinese companies that are world world class have been the ants and Baidu's and 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 uh, the IT companies who are working on certainly the AI part of uh, part of, of, of this. So that uh, so that uh, he they're they're slowing down in the areas that they were most uh, competitive. I, I I think that this sort of decoupling of the of the Chinese economy from the rest of the 
world is, is, is something you need to watch in this space, Bill. Uh, it's the, uh, because, because artificial vehicles involve so much data and data is so controversial and the trend these days seems to be certainly within China and in many other countries, don't let it out of your country, don't let other people have access to it, that we may, it, it may be that, uh, that separate uh, uh, AI industries and AV technologies grow up in China and in, in the, uh, and in the, in the rest of the world. So I, I think the, I think it's still too uncertain to, to say, especially with the final factor of, of the really inter interinvestment and cooperation among AV companies that we've, uh, we've seen, I mean, Pony IA testing in Silicon Valley, American investors, uh, go going into these companies, Chinese investors going into American, uh, AV, EV companies. Uh, it's, it's a brave man who predicts uh, which one of those two will be, <laughs> will be uh, dominant. All right, let's, um, we've got some good audience questions. Like I said, let's go to those and some of them we've addressed kind of so far. So we might be able to go through these fairly quickly, but um, uh, some of them are interesting, some of them are provocative. The first one is relates to what we were just talking about. China has shown tremendous ability to scale and upskill its manufacturing, particularly in areas like solar panel arrays that have leapfrogged US manufacturing. What paths can the US government take to ensure the AV industry has an ability to scale to prevent this from happening to them? Yeah, well, let me see if I can take a first shot at this. Uh, it's a great question. I, I think the first thing we've got to do is we've got to make sure that we can transition from R&D to testing and deployment at scale. We are stuck now. Uh, and so, as I said earlier, we do need to resolve this, get over this bridge and allow companies to be able to test and deploy, develop data, have that data inform continual uh, re, uh, reinvestments uh, and redevelopment. That's really where we got, that's first and foremost in my mind. We've got to do that first. The second thing we have to do is we have to make sure that we are, are invested in our own development and fabrication of semiconductors. Um, you know, these vehicles will require enormous amounts of computing power on board. And, and so to be reliant on on a broad supply chain, not to mention a semiconductor supply chain that's controlled by others, including China, is a big problem for us. So those are the two things. Let's get this done. Congress is debating uh, funding uh, Shifts Act, in other words, investments in, uh, in, in wafer fabrication here in the United States. Let's get, let's get this done. And then let's create this pathway to testing and deployment at scale uh, so that we can keep our lead, our current lead on AVs uh, over China. Okay, here's a uh, here's a provocative one. If you all want to duck it, I won't blame you. Why is the U.S. auto industry so far behind China in EVs, with the exception of Tesla? What really has been inhibiting GM, Ford, and others? Vision, talent, continued focus on combustion products, cash. Anybody want yeah. to take that on? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so let me see if I can try. It may, it may not be a complete answer because I, I, you know, I know you've got a lot of other uh, questions. I, I do think Admiral Blair laid out, uh, I think, a, a key element of this. There was a recognition in China that they could not take the same pathway to reducing criteria pollutant emissions from internal combustion engines that we did here in the United States. It's one of the great public health success stories that we virtually eliminated criteria pollutant emissions from gasoline powered engines. So we, that was a long journey for us. What the Chinese realized, in my view at least, is that if they took that, that same time and that same journey, that they would continue to exacerbate an already challenging, significantly problematic pollution situation in China. Uh, and so for, for pollution purposes, they saw EVs as a critical pillar. Uh, and so government focus, government investment, government incentives uh, to drive state-owned enterprises into the industry, uh, the EV industry is really what happened uh, in my view. Is I think that there's a lot of that. If you, if you were a resident of a big Chinese uh, city, 
the problem was not so much buying a car as it was getting a winning the lottery to buy a car. And uh, if you were willing to buy an EV, uh, you would go to the head of the line and get permission to buy a car. If you were by, uh, buying an electric uh, vehicle in Beijing or, sh or Shanghai, you entered a lottery and um, chances were it'd be five years before you could buy a car. So China really pushed uh, EVs in very uh, real ways. We allowed the market to do it. And like any huge market, um, you know, companies basically uh, protect what they have. They're, they're familiar with it. Uh, the, the, and and, and uh, they say, well, as soon as people change their minds, but uh, you know, ha, ha, what change have you seen in automobile advertising as, aside from, um, you know, long limbed women, uh, rolling over the, uh, rolling over the trunks of, uh, huge muscle cars. I mean, that's, that's still what companies push and, uh, cause that's where they make their money. And yeah, I was I, talking, I, I was talking to one of the go big... to another, an, another question. I, I, I think what you have seen though, is a shift $515 billion dollars. Yeah. Uh, which even in Washington is real money, is going to be invested in EV technology over this decade. Um, we are seeing product leadership sales of EVs doubled in the United States uh, mm -hmm. over, the, over the last uh, year. 78 individual electric vehicle models are in the marketplace today. That number will be 130 or so by mid-decade. And so you're seeing this, but, but the China story does suggest that this private sector leadership ought to be supported by a national strategy that includes other aspects of the private sector, utilities, developing infrastructure uh, and the like to be able to make sure this market develops and also to make sure that there are the appropriate alignments and incentives for the private sector to transition the industrial base to an EV industrial base. That's really um, the area of focus uh, that we need with regard to government policy, because we are competing with the Chinese government, not Chinese auto manufacturers. In some ways, Bill, this is uh, inevitable. And so I was talking to one of the big car manufacturers. A uh, modern car has about 35,000 engineered parts. It's expensive. It takes skill. Uh, it's not even a third of that for an electric vehicle. So we've seen this with turboprops driving other kinds of engines out of the airplane market. The, the question for policy is, do we want to accelerate this? Because inevitably, I don't, I don't want to give a number, 10 years, 20 years, every car will be an electric car. Uh, and every car will have autonomous uh, features on it. Uh, we can accelerate that, but the pricing alone means it's inevitable. Okay, here's another one. I want to get, get through these if we can. Is there room, appetite to collaborate with China on AV development? One thing China has in troves is data. They're testing AVs on Chinese roads in large numbers. Wouldn't that data and learning be helpful for U.S. regulatory development? On the flip side, what, if any, are the concerns about collaborating with China or Chinese companies on AV deployment in the U.S.? I'll start with that one because you have to remember in these things, and having talked a few times this year to various Chinese officials, um, it takes two. And the Chinese may not want to cooperate with us. They may not want to share data. Eventually, the two countries are going to need to find a way to work together. But right now, the Chinese kind of feel like, what do we get that we don't already have? If we can test in California, why would we give you things that will make you more competitive against us? So that could change. But right now, they don't seem to be that interested in talking. OK, uh, here's another one. The employment issue for existing truck drivers for AV is key and is not being addressed. Sure, jobs of the future, engineers, software, more college educated will be dislocated. It is the issue and it's not even it's not ever discussed. We're all for new tech, new skills, upskilling, but the the I guess 50 to 65 year old truck driver who makes big bucks will not be rehired. This is reality. John, you want to comment on that? Well, um, the, the last time I looked, we have a shortage of truck drivers. Uh, in the country. Uh, and so, um, you know, I, I think that um, whether that shortage is a result of the pandemic and other things happening that are more temporal, I'm not entirely sure, but I can tell you right now, 
we're short truck drivers. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, frankly, AV technology, V2V technology that allows platooning, um, those types of technologies, I think, can help address a shortage uh, of drivers. Um, with regard to uh, drivers that might not be able to be reskilled or, uh, uh, you know, uh, as uh, and might find themselves um, out of a job. I mean, you know, frankly, we'll have to see, you know, how that plays out. Uh, but, you know, I think as Jim said, you know, we, this is, this is sort of something we've continued to face as we continue to see productivity, as we continue to see automation, um, you know, play itself out um, over the course of the economy, which means we do need to focus as a matter of policy on education at the front end of the pipeline and also provide retraining opportunities as much as we can. And this is wildly optimistic and a, a little ideal, but we we now know the WTO story, which is open to China, made a lot of money, but failed to protect the people who were displaced. And so hopefully maybe this time we'll get it right. Uh, I wouldn't bet a lot on that, but I'm, I'm more optimistic than I was uh, some years ago. All right, this next one, I think we dealt with in part, but I wanna get a couple of you particularly I think Admiral Blair and Jim to comment on this uh, on part of this. If a robust U.S. auto, EV, and AV industry is critical to U.S. national security, what should the U.S. government commit to the industry, and what is the auto industry asking for? I think we John's already laid out what the industry is asking for, so I don't think we need to repeat that. Should the U.S. government be expected to fund the technology R&D, charging infrastructure, materials ecosystem for the industry? Anybody? I think I think John's basic prescription of just uh, just get out of the way with um, rules that allow the uh, the testing and the real identification of problems and alternatives is is the is the right one. I know on EVs uh, we are going to need some sort of government subsidy to get charging infrastructure into place. Uh, I I know some I know some people who have put up charging networks uh, around the world, and you just can't you can't pay pay for your bonds with the resource with the uh with the revenues that you get from uh people charging so there is there's got to be a government subsidy role there to get the uh charging infrastructure uh rolling but that that's really the one that uh and and i would personally favor uh the um the government uh, tax breaks on 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 covering the sh what i think is a short-term uh price differential between electric vehicles and uh autom and automobiles now it was what 7500 bucks for a while for the first 200,000 vehicles i think that ought to be extended in some fashion i think it should be means tested so we're not uh we're not uh subsidizing the rich tesla uh buyers but we are um making it possible for uh for average families to buy electric vehicles and have a place to charge them so i think there are spot places like that for a strong government uh role to push uh push EVs, but I think the greater part is, as, as John has described, is, is the uh, setting the regulatory framework so that we can deploy, gather data and scale. Yeah, and I would just add one thing on the EV side, if I could. Um, we really do need to figure out how to get control of raw materials, the, the, the EV yeah. supply chain. Yeah. Um, we've got to figure out how to permit mines here in the United States. We have to figure out how to process raw materials here in the United States um, so that we don't revisit the 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 uh the auto grade computer chip shortage that we have today because we're not in control of our own destiny there we do need to control the ev supply chain here so there's a government policy imperative there with regard to the things i just talked about uh, and then providing in the form of maybe investment tax credits or other uh uh supportive uh, measures the transition of the industrial base. So there are companies that make fuel pumps that aren't going to make need to make fuel pumps anymore, or you know other you know uh, turbochargers. Um, those companies need to be converted uh, into the EV economy, and I think there can be government tools in the toolbox to support that conversion and support American workers. At a high level, the prescription is pretty much the same it is for a lot of technology. Uh, government needs to support R and D and workforce development. That means uh, funding uh, tertiary education. Um, we need to look at infrastructure. That might be more local government. A lot of it might be market. We touched, we mentioned 5G, but spectrum allocation, the development of uh, more communications networks, that's 
partially government, not always federal. And then finally, the regulatory obstacles that we've brought up over and over again. And that's a hard one to do. It's hard to get anything out of Congress sometimes, but uh, removing regulatory obstacles, whether it's for raw materials or production. Um, so there's three things the federal government can do that really nobody else can. Yeah, um, we're at our time. Let me just uh, pick up on one thing Jim said and ask for a quick response on the uh, regulatory issues and particularly the exemption issue and the 2,500 limit that, that uh, we were talking about earlier. There's a sort of a question about this. Uh, that seems to, the, the questioner seems to feel this is sort of an obvious thing that people should be rallying around, but it, it hasn't happened. Is this a partisan issue? Is there some uh, congressional problem with fixing this? Um, you know, it, it, I, I, there is bipartisan support um, for expanding the exemption program. Um, but like many other things in Washington, uh, there are some special interests who see uh, a bill on AV policy moving and decide to throw their particular uh, issue onto the top of it. It slows the whole process down. That's what we're living with here. I do think there's bipartisan support for this, and we need to find a way forward uh, and a vehicle to move this as soon as possible. Well, we've reached the end. Let me ask each of you, uh, do you want to do a... Uh... Anybody, 15 second closing wise comment, uh, Admiral Blair, say something. I, I, would, I would say that, I would say that uh, we ought to be excited about this time we're in, in the American transportation industry. It, it feels to me more like, uh, you know, 1905, 1910, 1912, when there are all sorts of possibilities that are, uh, as, as uh, automobiles are replacing horses. And uh, so I think it's going to be a good, good time and we're gonna we're going to go to a, a a whole new level of transportation which will allow a a great uh quality of and better quality of life uh in the future than we have now so it's it's all good that was a great era uh except for the buggy buggy, uh, buggy whip manufacturers <laughs> right. and this is what jim was talking about earlier the transition always uh, raises these issues john a uh final 15 seconds and then i'll turn everything back to jim yeah, so I, I think the benefits, uh, we, we shouldn't lose sight of the benefits of highly automated vehicle uh, technology, safety, access to mobility, efficiency, emissions, and environment. These are really important public goods uh, that we'll get um, as we de deploy highly automated vehicles. And I just want to thank CSIS. Great, great discussion today. Thank you. Jim, over to you to close. Sure. Well, let me start by saying that if I was picking a city to test drive in, I would not pick San Francisco or Pittsburgh, having driven in them both. So hey, if it works there, it'll work anywhere. I mean, when they say Arizona, it's like, ah, it's flat. Who cares? Well, um, there's an active but, testing program in Pittsburgh, you know. Yeah, I do. SFO, San Francisco and Pittsburgh. Couldn't think. One thing we didn't talk about is demand. And I think that early studies show that demand for autonomous vehicles is probably going to be higher than we expect. So um, this is going to happen. Uh, the question for policy is how quickly do we want it to happen? How do we want to stack up against China? And we've had a good discussion. Let me thank our panelists. Let me thank Bill. Uh, everyone in the audience, thank you and have a good afternoon.